Hello everyone. Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to be reading Island of the Blue Dolphins, um, chapters 21 and 22, I think. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Chapter 21. I did not take Rontu with me when I left the cave that night, and I closed the opening so that he would not follow me, for if the Aleuts had brought their dogs, he would surely smell them out. I went quietly through the brush to the headland. Before I had climbed to the top of the high rock, I could see the glow of the Aleut fires. They had camped on the mesa at the place and the spring they had used before. It was less than half a league from my cave. I stood for a long time watching the fires, wondering if I should move to another part of the island, perhaps to the cave where the wild dogs had lived. I was not afraid that the men would discover me because they worked on the beach or hunted in their canoes all day. It was the girl I was afraid of. The ravine was tangled with brush, which was hard to walk through, but the ravine grew seeds and roots. Sometime, when she was out looking for food, she might wander by the spring and see that it was being used and find my steps leading to the cave. I stood on the rock until the alley fires died. I thought of everything I could do, of the different places I could go, and at last decided to stay in the ravine. The far end of the island had no springs, and if I moved there, I would have no place to hide the canoe, which I might need. I went back to the cave and did not leave it until the moon was full. There was little food left. Rongtu and I climbed to the headland, and when we passed the house, I saw that three of the whale ribs had been cut from the fence. No one was there or else Rongtu would have barked. I waited until the tide was low, which was close to dawn, and filled the basket with seawater and abalones. We were back in the cave before it grew light. The seawater kept the abalones fresh, but when we had to go out again, the night was too dark to find our way to the reef. I therefore had to gather roots. I could never gather many before the sun rose, so I went out every morning until the next moon came. Then I went to the reef for abalones. During all this time, I saw none of the Aleuts, nor did the girl come near the cave, though I found her footsteps far down the ravine where she had been to dig roots. The Aleuts had not brought their dogs, which was fortunate, for they would have found Rontu's tracks and followed us to the cave. The days were long for Rontu and me. At first he would pace up and down the cave and stand at the opening, sniffing through the cracks. I did not let him out, except when, he, when I was with him for fear he would go to the camp and not come back. After a while he got used to this and would lie all day and watch whatever I was doing. It was dark in the cave, even though when the, even when the sun was high, so I burned the small fish I had stored. By their light, I began to make a cormorant skirt, working every day on it. The ten skins I had taken at Tall Rock were now dry and in condition to sew. All of them from, were from male cormorants, whose feathers are thicker than those of the females and much glossier. The skirt of yucca fibers was simple to make. I wanted this one to be better, so I cut the skins carefully and sewed them with great care. I made the bottom first, putting the skins end to end and using three of them. For the rest of the skirt, I sewed the others along their sides so that the feathers ran one way on the upper part and a different way along the bottom. It was a beautiful skirt, and I finished it on the day after the second moon. I had burned all of the little fish, and since I could catch no more until the alleyids left, I took the skirt outside to work on it there. I had found footsteps to the ravine twice, again after the first time, but none closer to the cave. I had begun to feel safe, for the winter storms would soon be here and the Aleuts would leave. Before another moon they would be gone. I had never seen the skirt in the sunlight. It was black, but underneath were green and gold colors, and all the feathers shimmered as though they were on fire. It was more beautiful than I had thought it would be. I worked fast now that it was almost finished, yet from time to time I would stop to hold it against my waist. Rontu, I said, feeling giddy with happiness. If you were not a male dog, I would make you one too, as beautiful as this. Rontu was sprawled out at the mouth of the cave. He raised his head and yawned at me, and then went back to sleep. I was standing in the sunlight, holding the skirt to my waist, when Rontu leaped to his feet. I heard the sound of steps. It came from the direction of the spring. And as I turned quickly, I saw the girl looking down at me from the brush. My spear stood beside the mouth of the cave within easy reach. The girl was not more than ten paces from me, and with one movement I could have picked up the spear and thrown it. 
Why I did not throw the spear, I do not know, for she was one of the Aleuts who had killed my people on the beach of Coral Cove. She said something, and Ratu left the mouth of the cave and walked slowly towards her. The hair raised on his neck, but then he walked to where she stood and let her touch him. The girl looked at me and made a motion with her hands, which I tried, which I took to mean that Rontu was hers. No, I cried and shook my head. I picked up my spear. She started to turn and I thought she was going to flee back through the brush. She made another motion, which I took to mean that Rontu was mine now. I did not believe her. I held the spear over my shoulder, ready to throw. Tuk tok, she said, pointing to herself. I did not say my name. I called Rontu and he came back. The girl looked at him and then at me and smiled. She was older than I, but not so tall. She had a broad face and small eyes that were very black. When she smiled, I saw that her teeth were worn down from chewing seal sinew, but they were very white. I was still holding the cormorant skirt, and the girl pointed to it and said something. There was one word, winstcha, that sounded like a word that means pretty in our language. I was very proud of the skirt that I'd I was so proud of the skirt that I did not think. The spear was in my hand, but I held up the skirt so the sunlight could shine on it. The girl jumped down from the ledge and came over to me and touched it. Winchcha, she said again. I did not say the word, but she wanted to hold the skirt, and I gave it to her. She put it against her waist and let it fall from her hips, turning one way and the other. She was graceful, and the skirt flowed around her like water, but I hated the alleyutes, and I took it from her. Winchta, she said. I had not heard words spoken for so long that they sounded strange to me, yet they were good to hear, even though it was an enemy who spoke them. She said other words I do not remember, but now, as she spoke, she looked over my shoulder towards the cave. She pointed to the cave and then to me and made gestures as if she were making a fire. I knew that she wanted me to say, I knew she wanted me to say, but I did not say it. She wished to know if I lived there in the cave so that she could come back with men and take me to their camp. I shook my head and pointed to the far end of the island, away, for I did not trust her. She kept looking toward the cave, but she said nothing more about it. I held the spear, which I could have thrown. I did not, though I feared she would return with the hunters. She came over to me and touched my arm. I did not like the feel of her hand. She said more words and smiled again, and walked to the spring and drank. The next moment she had disappeared in the brush. Brontu did not try to follow her. She made no noise as she went. I crawled back to the cave and began to pack the things I owned. I had all the day to do so because the men were working and would not return to their camp before night. By nightfall, I was ready to go. I planned to take my canoe and go to the west part of the island. I would sleep there on the rocks with, until the alleyutes left, moving from place to place if I needed to. I carried five baskets up the ravine and hid them near my house. It was getting dark, and I had to go back to the cave for two that were left. Carefully, I crawled through the brush and stopped just above the mouth of the cave and listened. Rontu was beside me, and he listened, too. No one could go through the brush in the dark without making a sound except someone who had lived in it for a long time. I went past the spring and waited, and then onto the cave. I felt that someone had been there while I was away. They could be hiding in the dark watching me. They were waiting until I went into the cave. I was afraid, so I did not go in, but quickly turned around. As I did so, I saw something in front of the cave on the flat rock I used for a step. It was a necklace of black stones of a kind I had never seen. Chapter 22 I did not go into the cave, nor did I take the necklace from the rock. That night I slept on the headland at the place where I left my baskets. At night I went back to the ravine. There I hid myself on a brushy ledge. It was near the spring, and from it I could see the mouth of the cave. The sun rose and shone, th shone through the ravine. I could see the necklace lying on the rock. The stones looked blacker than they had in the darkness, and there were many of them. I wanted to go down to the cave and count them to see if they would make two loops around my neck, but I did not leave the ledge. I stayed there all morning. The sun was high when Rontu barked, and I heard steps below me. The girl came out of the brush singing. She walked to the cave, and when she saw the necklace lying on the rock, she grew quiet. She picked up the necklace and put it down again and peered into the mouth of the cave. Two of my baskets were still there. Then she went and drank from the spring and started off through the brush. I jumped to my feet. Tuk-tok, I cried, running down the ravine. 
Chook talk. She came out of the brush so quickly that she must have been waiting nearby to see if I would return. I ran to the rock and picked up the necklace and turned around for her to admire it. The beads made not two long loops, but three. They were long and oval instead of round, which is a very hard shape to make and takes much skill. Wichita, she said. Wichita, I said, after her, the word strange on my tongue. Then I said the word that meant pretty in our language. Wintai, she said and laughed because this was strange to her. She touched the necklace, giving the word for it, and I gave mine. We pointed out other things, the spring, the cave, a gull flying, the sun, the sky, the sky, Rontu sleeping, trading the names for things and laughing because they were so different. We sat there on the rock until the sun was in the west and played this game. Then Tuktok rose and made a gesture of farewell. Mane, she said, and waited to hear my name. Wana Pili, I answered, which, as I have said, means the girl with the long black hair. I did not tell her my secret name. Mane Wana Pili, she said. Pase no Tuktok, I replied. I watched her go through the brush. I stood for a long time listening to her footsteps until I could hear them no more, and then I went to the headland and brought the baskets back to the cave. Tuktok came again Tuktok came again the next day. We sat on the rock in the bright sun, trading words and laughing. The sun went fast in the sky. The time came soon when she had to leave, but she returned on the day that followed. It was on this day when she was leaving that I told her my secret name. Karana, I said, pointing to myself. She repeated the word, but she did not understand what it meant. Wana Pili, she said, fr frowning. I shook my head, pointing again to myself. Karana. Her black eyes opened wide. Slowly, she began to smile. Paseno, Karana, she said. That night, I began to make a gift for her in return for the necklace she had given me. At first, I thought I would give her a pair of my bone earrings. But remembering that her ears were not pierced and that I had a basket of abalone shells already flaked into thin discs, I thought about making a circlet for her hair. I bored two holes in each of the discs using thorns and fine sand. Between them, I put ten olivelle, olivella shells, which were no longer than the tips of my little fingers, and threaded them all together with sinew. I worked five nights on the circlets, and on the fifth day, when she came, I gave it to her, putting it on her head and tying it in the back. Winchta, she said and hugged me. She was so pleased that I forgot how sore my fingers were from boring the holes in the hard shells. Many times she came to the cave, and then one morning she did not come. I waited for her all that day, and at dusk I left the cave and went to the ledge where I could watch the ravine, fearing that the men had learned that I lived here and would find me. That night I slept on the ledge. The night was cold with the first wind of winter. Tuktok did not return the next day, and I remembered that it was near the time when the Aleut hunters would leave. Perhaps they had already gone. That afternoon I went to the headland. I climbed the rock and crawled across it until I could look over at the rim. My heart beat loud. The Aleut ship was still there, but men were working on the decks and canoes were going back and forth. The wind blew hard and few bales of otter skin lay on the shore, so the ship would probably leave at dawn. It was dark when I got back to the ravine. Since the wind was very cold and I was no longer afraid that the Aleuts would find me, I made a fire in the cave and cooked a supper of shellfish and roots. I cooked enough for Ronchu and me and for Tuktok. I knew Tuktok would not come, yet I put her food beside the fire and waited. Once Ronchu barked and I thought I heard the sound of footsteps and went to the opening and listened. I waited a long time and did not eat. Clouds moved from the north, covering the cold skies. The wind grew louder and made wild noises in the ravine. At last, I closed the mouth of the cave with stones. At dawn, I went to the headland. The wind had died. Fog lay over the sea, washing against the island in gray waves. I waited a long time for a glimpse of Coral Cove, but finally the sun burned away the fog. The little harbor was deserted. The Aleut ship with its red-beaked prow and red sails had gone. At first, knowing that I could now leave the cave and move back into my house on the headland, I was happy. But as I stood there on the high rock looking down at the deserted harbor and empty sea, I began to think of Tuktok. I thought of all the times we had sat in the sun together. I could hear her voice and see her black eyes squinting closed when she laughed. 
Below me, Ranchu was running along the cliff, barking at the screaming gulls. Pelicans were chattering as they fished in the blue water. Far off, I could hear the bellow of a sea elephant. But suddenly, as I thought of Tuktok, the island seemed very quiet. So, <clears throat> we've talked a little bit before in the description of the videos and um, and in, in the just the chatting about how this book is about colonialism and it talks about genocide. So genocide is when a whole group of people are killed just because of who they are. Um, and so uh, Karana's tribe, their, her whole tribe is killed because they're indigenous to that, to that island. So that's where they're from. And there's other people who come and they want the things that are there. And rather than trying to talk it out, it's just easier for them to kill everyone who lives there. And that's a very bad thing, but it happens sometimes. And that's not okay. It just means that it's something that we should know happens sometimes. We need to remember those people who've had that happen. Um, this is actually based on a real story. Um, so Karana is, um, I don't remember if that was her real name or not, but there was actually a woman who did live alone like this after her whole tribe was killed um, in a place called the Channel Islands, which are some islands off of the coast of California in the United States. Um, and, uh, and so the Aleuts refer to um, a particular group of people from Russia um, who would come down and they would hunt for otters, uh, which at the time were very popular um, for people to wear the furs. Um, it was very fashionable. Uh, and so it was more important for people to make money by selling otter fur than to let the people who lived there live there in, in peace at their homes. Um, in this part of the story, um, so we talked a little bit before about how Karana is finally starting to feel comfortable. She's been living there for a long time. She feels safe. She's starting to see beauty on the island, even though her whole family and her tribe is, and has died. She's starting to notice flowers and colors and things. Well, now she's, she's had a scary experience. The people that killed her whole village, they're back and she's scared and she's scared that they're going to hurt her. So she has to go hide in a cave for a couple of months. Um, but she also makes a new friend and there's beauty in that. And so we see that kind of beauty represented in a symbol. So a symbol is something that represents something else in a story a lot of the time. Um, so Karana, first she has the cormorant skirt and then she has the necklace that, uh, Tuktok gives her. Both of those are things that are dark black, which a lot of times, um, in stories, they represent something that's, um, like scary or bad or difficult for the, uh, for the character and, or even loneliness. She's very lonely. She's having difficulties. She's literally living in a dark cave for a couple of months and that's difficult. She had to leave her home again. Um, just like she had to leave her home when the Aleuts came the first time. Um, but she knows how to take care of herself now. She's got Rontu and then she meets Tuktok. And so um, with both the skirt and the necklace, those are things that are beautiful. They're for dressing up. She talks about the beautiful colors of the feathers. She talks about how special this necklace is because it's a gift. Also, how much time that was put into it. That's a, It's a special shape of bead. It's a kind of stone she's never seen before. So... Karana's in a place in her life where she's been able to heal a little bit from the bad things that have happened to her. And even when things are hard, she's still able to find beautiful things in her life. And, um, and that's, uh, I think that's really important for a character who has experienced so many hard things. Um, what's also important to think about is that the person who wrote this book, a man named Scott Odell, and he's a, I, I think he's a very good writer. A lot of the books he writes are actually about the struggles of indigenous people, so people like Native Americans um, and the hardships they've had to face. Um, he himself is not 
um, an indigenous person. So these are not stories from his family. There's not experiences that he's experienced himself. He usually tries to tell the stories of people who have um, been, they've had genocide happen to them. So all of them are gone. And all we have, all we know about them are uh, historical records. Um, and that doesn't mean that all indigenous people, all Native Americans are all gone. But there are some groups of them who did have that happen so much that all of those members of some groups are gone. And Scott O'Dell likes to tell those stories so that we don't forget that those people were here. Um, and so then if you were ever to read a book by someone who is indigenous and is telling their own story or a story that happened in their family, you would probably get a different perspective than a, than from someone who did not have that happen in their family. And they're only telling it from historical documents because historical documents are often written by the people who did the genociding um, because they were the only ones left. So they got to tell their version of the story. So that's important too, to remember. Um, but I think it's, and just one last thing, um, we see Karana making a friend with Tuktok. And while at first they're afraid, or Karana's afraid, because she sees that Tuktok is with the Aleuts, she starts to realize that actually she and Tuktok have a lot in common. Um, they have some words in common. They both know Rontu. Um, and it doesn't really say it in the book, but it's very possible that uh, Tuktok might not even have chosen to be with the Aleuts. That maybe something similar happened with her people. Maybe wherever she was living, the Aleuts showed up and either took all of the people in her village or only took her. And now that's just where she lives is with them. Um, and it seems like Karana might know that. Um, and, um, and that's also part of their bond is that they, they have things in common. They've had hardships together, um, which makes it extra difficult when, um, Tuk Tok leaves with the Aleuts and Karana could go with her and then they would have each other, but Karana wouldn't be free anymore. She wouldn't be able to make her own choices. And it's we see at the end of that part that once again, she's standing at Coral Cove where her whole family was taken away from her, her whole tribe. And now her friend is gone. But she's kind of torn because the Aleuts are gone. That danger is gone. But now the last person that she's talked to in how many years has left again. And she's, that's a complicated feeling to be happy and sad at the same time. Um, so it's a, it's, there's a lot going on in the story. It's a really good story. Um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for uh, watching. We're gonna, we're getting there. We're getting to the end of the book. Um, and I have another book lined up for us to read after. Also, some of you have been throwing out some uh, ideas about what other videos you'd like to see. Um, different science experiments, other books. Um, if there's if there's things you'd like me to do videos about, go ahead and comment and let me know. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys are doing really well. Bye.